Rajiv, thanks so much for joining me today. Oh, My no. first question is that you've had a spectacular career and you know, you just about started out in a very interesting space, which is politics. Uh, my question to you is that uh, what, looking back, are the two, three big milestones you think that really defined who you are today? Funny enough, Vinny, I've been asked this question more than once and I have always tried to I've struggle to find those two to three milestones. I think I've had many milestones and I think that's what makes my life and my journey a bit different because I have had uh, many, many, many um, uh, points in my life that have been very impactful and transformational and have impacted me in more ways than one. So I, I think, uh, you know, if you really want to look at milestones, one was uh, the milestone of my father probably um, forcing me to get out of India and go into the US to get uh, a higher degree. So that I think clearly sent me in a direction mm. which otherwise I would not have uh, had access to. The second was, I think, uh, the stint where I went from being an electrical engineer to a computer scientist. And I took to coding and software like a fish takes to water. So mm. that was, I think, an epic moment for me because when I was in the US and I was doing my master's, uh, most of what you see today were in the labs and were conceptual, the internet, the, the workstation, the desktop, uh, multitasking operating systems, um, the whole distributed client server model that we all take for very granted whether it's an Apple watch and a phone or whatever else you see in your life. All those were being played out in labs and I had the opportunity of working in a computing environment where a lot of hacking a lot of uh, real builds of kernels and operating systems were going on. So I think that was the second big thing for me. And of course, I, I still maintain there are many things that have happened ever since, but my um, career at Intel and the, the way I got into Intel is all, to me, mm. scripted because it seems to me scripted because I had a job offer from Microsoft. I was a software engineer. And that was my natural place to go. And it just turned out that the person who was doing some hiring in Intel happened to be the brother of a doctor in the Air Force who treated me when I was a chronically asthmatic kid when I was young. Mm. And that was Vindham. And Vindham, of course, then went to become the father of the Pentium. And, and, and you and worked very closely with him. Over he then. hired me into Intel. Yeah. So in he, fact, you, you've gone on record because you spent a lot of time looking at your journey. You've gone on record to say that, you know, the work atmosphere at Intel, the, the fact that at that time it was this vibrant startup also defined you as a professional in absolutely, many ways. Absolutely. What were the two, three things that stand out? No, I think uh, a part of it was this culture that uh, egalitarian culture that only focused on capability, competency and what you delivered. So I think that no frills culture that focused really on only a person's abilities and talent was something that you don't see that often. And even today, 25, 30 years later in India, you're still hard pressed to find that kind of a culture. And the, the heroes of Intel at that time were real heroes. They were very, very big men. They were Andy Grove. Yeah. And it was not unusual at that time for us to go to get a, piece, a donut and a coffee in the cafeteria to find Andy uh, and Bill Gates and Larry Ellison and uh, you know people sitting around and just talking through ideas and talking through what they believe the next big thing would be. And so Intel was a very, very, very great company. It is in the history of technology, I think one of the least, uh, un it's, it's one of the most underrated companies, but I think it's been the most powerful um, catalyst to what we see today in terms of delivering in silicon and, and computing power what the imagination uh, in software and uh, you know, Absolutely. the IT companies in those days uh, were creating. You were part of that generation that went and were pioneers in the technology space at a time when a lot of the, uh, you know, the, the, the concepts were coming together. <clears throat> Today you have a Satya Nadella, you have a Sundar, uh, you know, all of them leading big companies. What, what has made Indians do so well, you think, in these technology firms and what should youngsters be picking up? No, that? I think the, the, the key attribute to the Silicon Valley and the key defining characteristics, if you, if you want to call it that, and that is what creates all these, you know, performers and achievers, uh, 
is that it really only focuses on your ability and capability. It doesn't bother about where you came from, what was your last degree, how sophisticated you sound, what clothes you dress, what car you drive. Mm. None of that matters because as you, after you enter the little uh, you know, garage or the office that you call your development center, it's really about your mind and what you can do with that mind and, your, uh, uh, and the computing platform that you're working on. Mm. So the Sundars and the Satyas and, uh, you know, and, and countless others, Vindhams and all of these people really went there and had to only demonstrate what they were capable of doing. And they did that. So it did not matter that you were Chinese or you were Indian or you were not American or you were Asian. And that I think is what is a defining attribute of the Silicon Valley. The ecosystem of creativity and the almost uh, nonchalant approach towards excellence mm. where uh, people kind of expect it from you and it is not then tom tommed about of course in recent times as you create billionaires and billionaires there are there are, there are some changes to that but at the end of the day um, it was really about i mean i have met some of the smartest men uh, that have walked this earth and i can tell you they were also the humblest of men mm. so that is an interesting combination that you don't see and Especially now that I'm in Delhi, where the, the least smart men are all, almost often the most loudest and the most vocal. So, I think that is an interesting combination where capability, competency, innovation and creativity and a, and a humility that you are about as smart as your idea and there's always another young person who will come around who will be smarter than you in a couple of years or in a decade. That, that's well, very well put. Do you see that happening when you see this whole wave of entrepreneurs coming up, 27-year-olds who are setting up companies? No, no, I see some very smart minds, you know, and uh, that, is the, that is the difference. I think uh, India now in the 2013 plus, post-2013, and entre entrepreneurship, let's say, in the early 2000s and pre-2000, there is a clear contrast. There is a clear qualitative difference in the youngsters that are now coming out and pushing ideas in that there is a lot more confidence uh, there is a lot more um, intellectual property and idea that is backing the confidence uh, and there are just smarter people out there today mm -hmm. that is not to say all of them are smart that is not to say all of them are confident and all of them will succeed but I can see the difference and the depth and the intensity uh, in, in the current crop mm. of entrepreneurs that I clearly did not see in the early days. I mean, I, sure. I saw, I've seen entrepreneurs in the early days of Indian entrepreneurship, but they were driven more by connections, network, okay. And, and that gets me to the next obvious question because when I spoke about milestones, I mean, you didn't mention the more, the most, um, you know, exciting and game changing piece of your own career, which was really being a young Turk of the telecom industry, the first private company to get the telecom license in fact right. uh, in, in that sense through BPL. So at that time I know you went through a lot of hard learning you know to, to be able to successfully right. uh, you know uh, uh, steer the company. What were the lessons then and uh, how has that what, what did that do to you as a person? So I said I, I started by saying I have more than three milestones and I just gave you the first three. Mm. Uh, so I think uh, cellular in India that whole story of how I got into it what I made out of that opportunity and how I ended it is again a big milestone for me. It's something that I spent almost 12 years of my life on. And it transformed me in again in ways that are very, 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 very deep. Um, it, it completely altered me uh, from being a techie geek whose entire life started and ended with you know doing 10,000 lines of C code or uh, Pascal code to suddenly thinking about profit and loss, business plans and balance sheets, which I... And regulatory frameworks. Yeah, and, and regulatory came later, but okay. the initial thing was about business. What is a business? I mean, I, I did not know anything about business excepting the value of the Intel stock options that I got at the age of 24. Uh, so, it was transformational. Again, it was uh, clearly driven by a fate presenting an opportunity when I met Rajesh Pilot, as I've told you earlier in an earlier encounter. Where, who was a student of my father's in the Air Force and he said to me in 1991 saying why aren't you coming back to India and trying something here and so at the age of 26 I said 
why don't I take an India break and mm. why don't I do an India experiment? And at the age of 25, 26, you are fearless, you can take risk. And I did exactly that. And it turned out that that risk taking, which is really, in a sense, the signature of my life, I took that risk and I went into a completely new direction, mm. which is being an entrepreneur, starting a business and doing so in an area that nobody had heard of not just in India, but most parts of the world. Um, and it was difficult. It was mm -hmm. difficult because just like I didn't know very much about it, uh, the rest of the country didn't know very much about it. And, and more importantly, the government that I had to deal with clearly did not know anything about it. And then, of course, we have the invariable Indian uh, phenomenon of having made it and built it out amidst adverse circumstances, suddenly attracting the attention of the classic Indian business who suddenly don't want you to do it anymore and they want to get into it. So all of that has been sure. uh, tremendously learning and in my, in my opinion even my career in politics which I of course got into after I exited telecom has a lot to do with my learnings and experiences in telecom and that the need that I felt in my heart and my uh, stomach to get into politics was in a lot of ways driven by what I experienced as an entrepreneur in telecom. So you famously said that you'd never do a business and of course after that, after you sold out of BPL Telecom, you did uh, become an investor and you've got a great portfolio. But you did go on record to say I would never do anything where there's regulation involved and government involved. Yeah. But then you joined politics. So my question to you is that when you sit in parliament and you have been on the select committee of two very, very important bills, one is the GST and one is the real estate bill, and you've seen the crisis in parliament around that, as a citizen of the country, as somebody who has gone through the ranks, mm. what does it make you feel about Indian politics and what is the change that the youth should expect in politics really? So uh, a couple of things, I think um, uh, being within the uh, round building and the corridors of the round building which is parliament and being outside uh, are two different perspectives of politics. On the outside and I, I'm being, uh, I'm not saying this because I'm a politician now or I'm an MP now. Things to see are usually taken in a far more simplistic mm. manner that, than things usually are. We are a very complex nation and that is the starting point of everything in, in India. And complex, I say, not in a flattering way. Complex in, this, in, the, in the sense that there are too many very, very contradictory agendas that are pulling and pushing this country around. So there is... There is the reality of um, many states that are continuing to be behind the average economic prosperity of the country and their priorities are different. Then you have states that are in the south and the west, their priorities are different and the people's priorities are different. So one thing I have learned after getting into parliament is that A, that the, the citizenry have not uh, in a sense try to understand politics beyond the headline mm. and so therefore there is always a tendency or a temptation to measure the performance of politics in a very digital one zero they are good they are bad they are good they are bad mm. that is dangerous because I think to be an informed citizen you need to be informed about the nuances of uh, politics and policy making what does that policy intend to do what is the objective? What are the execution risk issues on that? So I think a slightly more sophisticated understanding of politics is necessary for the citizenry and a democracy to be really become more involved, number one. Number two is on the converse side that I believe that most members of parliament are inherently driven by some issue. So given the, the nature of our democracy, a the preponderance and the large majority of our MPs are more focused on rural, poverty, agricultural, those kinds of issues. Not because they, that is their forte, but that's where they come from and that's what their constituency is. So the limited majority or limited uh, minority of uh, MPs who are focused on economy, entrepreneurship, skills, technology, is really a small minority. Mm. And even there, I think there is not enough of an effort to understand in depth what the real issues are. So therefore you have controversies like porn ban, net neutrality, 
all of this are these are unnecessary controversies being created not because people don't have the right intention but they have the right information the right they have unfortunately a lack of deep knowledge sure you know going getting back to your career and i think the, the reason we are doing this video is also to tell students what it takes to succeed what they should be keeping in mind and i'm going to now steer the conversation towards that my first question is that you always told me that you look at your career as as five year plan mm. it's really about benchmarking where do i want to be in five years right. and you know what what should youngsters do ambitious hard working youngsters yeah. on how they can really plan their careers no i think the, you answered the question partly i think first of all you have to be ambitious and hard working you have to be an ambitious and hard working about certain goals i mean the moment you don't have those three then you're just taking a walk in the park i always tell and i have i have the privilege of addressing a lot of university students from time to time i always say that one of the mistakes i made was that i wasn't as intense a student that i think i should have been mm. not intense in terms of cramming but intense in terms of the experience uh, and then you know you tend to make it all about parties and uh, you know hanging out and hanging out with friends and then the 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 actual academic side tends to become like let's just do it i think those four or five years that you spend in your undergrad or your grad programs are very very defining the more the more you understand that before you start it the more you accept that those are going to define in a lot of ways where you end up mm. 10 20 30 years from now the more intensity you will put into that so i always say that look think of this as like a triathlon i mean to quote a you know iron man milan soman example think of this as an iron man triathlon but do it with enjoy it but do it with a clear expectation and goals that you set for yourself that i will be good in at the end of those four years i will be good in this could be poetry writing it could be painting i don't know what whatever it is mm. but you have to come out of it with a certain set of things that then propel you into the next stage Sure. But if you just drift through those four years or three years, saying that I just go there, get my attendance, and come back with a A or a B and a B A or a B S C or a B E or a B Tech or whatever the case is, then you, in a sense, blown those four years. And blowing those four years are going to be, I mean, to the larger majority of students, are going to be a big, big, big setback for you. So have clear goals and take a degree of intensity into those four years or three years in that undergrad grad program. that will really hold you in good stead going forward and i'm not trying to sound very grandfatherish about this i'm just talking to you from a point of view of that is really what propels excellence and achievement sure. you know also when you start you know in india there is a tendency to look at education in one long side Correct. and in the us it's all about really getting real I experience yes. and getting into a uh, uh, work yes. early what should youngsters do when they're planning their careers and how important is continuous learning right. to continuously reskill yourself upgrade your skill sets no i think learning continuous learning is an absolute need because we tend to in india think of learning as a curriculum learning which is that you say one to four years or one to three years i've got my little degree and that's where my education starts and ends that is really not what is required in the real world i today learn I read up the constitution uh, you know thick document called the constitution because that is what we discuss in in parliament if you don't learn read absorb and this need not be skilling it could be just broad knowledge it could be experiential it could be from another person's life it could be another uh, business case that you read about it could be another technology uh, you know like an essay on it um, if you don't learn then you will clearly not succeed this is just a, it's just a dictum number 1 put it down there as a rule uh, in the rule book that if you are not constantly absorbing from what you see hear and read and if you are not constantly hearing seeing and reading you are just going to be one of many 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 people if you want to stand out you will only stand out because of your innate ability of course that is very important but also about how much knowledge and experience you have mm. now knowledge and experience you either get by like reading and observing and you know and getting advice or you also get it as a combination of that and doing things yourself so why are the big best it ceos or technology ceos people who are all coders 
who, why are they all people who've been uh, behind a machine doing something? It's because that's how you learn. That's how you learn the possibilities and the impossibilities. What mm -hmm. is probable and what is improbable. Sure. So, uh, I mean, the days that you can only spin your way and market and hype your way to success is long gone. Because in this new world, mm -hmm. that will, like a house of cards will collapse in a flash. Absolutely. Because the availability of knowledge or, and information has been, you know, Absolutely. it just blows your mind. Yes. So, to keep pace with that, it's really important, otherwise you are going to be irrelevant. Right. So, what is the role of digital education, for instance? Now everything is available on your smartphone, yeah. on your laptop, and how can people use it effectively? So, if you take my previous answer and you connect it to this question, I mean, Digital India and actually knowledge online is going to be the way that you keep yourself abreast of what is, what is required for you to succeed. Mm -hmm. So you will have your textbooks and you will have your curriculum and you will have your university and you will have your uh, peering and you know mentoring. But at the end of the day, how much you absorb on your own, uh, how much you learn on your own, how much you uh, assimilate from what is going on in terms of trends and other people's views is all to do with online. And I go back to my early days when in Intel as a, a member of the Pentium architecture team, we came up with a cutting edge design of a twin pipeline microprocessor. And we ideated this on what was the internet of those days, which is Usenet. We had this, these focus groups, these news groups called comp.arc, computer.architecture. And we would toss, I would toss a question in there and we would get from all around the country and the world, we would get 150 suggestions. So that is really how even as a CPU architect, I went from being an average person to, uh, you know, what I believe was, you know, reasonably cutting edge. Which, not because I suddenly discovered overnight through some revelation of mine in, in the dream. It is because you go out there and connect with a network of knowledge. And that is what the future learning is about. It is about connecting to all of this that is residing all over the world and in many, many people's minds and pulling it out of them and getting it into yours. And that can only happen in this digital sort of a architecture and landscape. I've got two uh, questions. Uh, one is that, you know, you interact a lot with the youth. Yeah. There's a great demographic dividend that we are seeing. There is a lot of uh, ambition out there. But there is, what are we lacking? What should the youth be focusing on? What is your advice to the youth? No, I, I think, uh, look, I, I mean, it's very difficult, first of all, to homogenize youth. I sure. mean, there are, there is, the youth you can only define as a category based on age. But amongst them there are really, really driven people who have got who are hungry. Then there are people on the other end of the spectrum who are just laid back and don't care. Then somewhere in between there are people who want to do and good. And then there's the urban rural yeah. so, so education. I think it's very difficult. Yeah. But I can say this to those who want to excel that it has become extremely competitive today. In the 10 years before 2013, 10 to 15 years before 2013, mm. it was much easier. Mm. And easier was because, it was easier not because it was easier for entrepreneurship, but it was easier because the competition for ideas wasn't as intense. The whole all-pervasive in, you know, growth of technology and digital you know, platforms and online the internet into more and more homes and uh, the easy availability of it is just making it so much easier for a youngster to become an entrepreneur. And the one issue that in my days I held us all back or was a big issue was capital. Mm. In the early 90s, mid 90s and all the way to the uh, late 90s, the issue was that there was finite amount of venture capital and capital backing ideas and there were more people wanting it. So it was a bit of a mismatch. Now it's the reverse. There is actually capital chasing good ideas and capital chasing good minds. So capital is no longer the issue. The, the ability to take an idea into a proof of concept is no longer an issue because you have now, you know, the world is at your doorstep. You don't have to have a marketing team and a chief marketing officer and a sales officer all over the world. You don't need all of that. So it has never been easier, but it's never been more competitive. Mm. Just because it's easy for you, it's also easy for another 10 million youngsters who are all energetic, bubbling with ideas. So it's, it's a combination of it's never been easier, but it's never been more competitive. 
and that is why the next crop of successful entrepreneurs will be very very different men and women they will be real ideas but also will be very defining in terms of themselves as people very very clear temperament of rigor of discipline of uh, execution it won't be just about you know a great idea it will be ideas plus the ability to transform those ideas into real businesses so we have had a crop of entrepreneurs who came who have now become very successful because they had great ideas and they took the early jump <clears throat> the next crop will be people who can take those ideas and will have to demonstrate a large amount of execution expertise and you know the ability to actually transform them into real entities it all will boil down to how much you invest in yourself also right yeah, yeah. i mean, mean success will be determined by how hard you are willing to work on yourself 100% i think finally at the end of the day you know it is only the losers who will keep blaming everybody else in the environment for the for the failures the true losers i mean true successes are those who blame themselves and hold themselves accountable for their losses and of course know that they will determine their own success so i always say this because i have we have investments and so when uh, uh we have in one of our mistakes invested in a whiny entrepreneur who says then you know i failed because of x or file failed because of that y or five it was you know that's you know straight off that he'll never be a success mm. uh you you can fail but it, you should not fail because you did not know things were coming the way they were coming they are going to come and Or, you should be nimble enough to exactly so that's exactly so you should know what's going to happen respond and failures are par par for the course i mean some ideas fail some ideas succeed but the ideas that fail should not fail because you were overwhelmed by the environment that you were operating in or by your competition that is in my opinion a failure of yourself mm -hmm. uh, but if you fail despite putting everything into it when you fought a good fight I, i i say this there's no harm in losing a fight if you fought a good fight uh, but uh, invariably i would say that if you fought a good fight and you have a good idea and you have a little bit of luck on your side you will succeed and it's only a question of how how much success you have last question is on upgrade you know the whole idea of this online education platform is to help people uh, you know get access to education and uh, and uh, courses at any given time at any stage of their career it's really about right. upgrading your skills what's your message for upgrade no i think uh, look my own view on education in india is that it needs to be transformed anyway uh, it the current uh, model of education which is a top down sort of fill the mind up with something that has been bottled and distilled by some three experts sitting somewhere is just not the right model for us as a young country we have to be learning from youngsters have to learn from successful experiences and they have to learn from mentors they have to see increasingly and they have to learn from and they have to shape their own thinking knowledge and experiences from true success stories in india and these successes could be in as diverse a field as ngos banking uh, business whatever but i think that is the best way to learn the the meaning of uh, existing and succeeding in life you have to learn from success not from a textbook 